Okay, so second packet. And let's just do a little review here. Different types of white blood cells. First, the uh, name for a white blood cell. Leukocyte. How many different leukocytes are there? Five. Uh, what's the most numerous of the leukocytes? Numerous. I gave you guys a little mnemonic to know it. I thought I did. The monkey one? Neutrophils. Yes. I know, I just want to see. I heard different answers. I want to make sure people are confident. Neutrophils, okay? I heard. All right, never let monkeys eat bananas. You're taking the first letter of each of these and just using them in a sentence. So, neutrophils, never. Right, that's the first one. Let monkeys. What's the least numerous of all these? Basal fill. So again, you're gonna see that information slide by slide by slide. Like the next slide, it'll say neutrophils are 50 to 70 percent of white blood cells. What am I asking is, out of all the white blood cells, what is the most <coughs> numerous? What's the least numerous? Put them in order. Whatever thing. So you will see the information slide by slide. But I'm trying to help you out because when it comes time for the exam and you're looking through, it's going to make your notes much more easier instead of shuffling through and saying, okay, what's the bigger percentage here? So again, keys to organizing it so your test will be easier. The neutrophil is the most numerous. And then I remember we were getting into this. These, this and the next slide were the last slides we got into. These, no? Right? Granulocytes. Okay, we do this in lab too, so hopefully it's starting to overlap. Since you got lab tonight, then you'll see this. Granulocytes, what's the first granulocyte over here? The neutrophil, then? Eosinophil, or another name you'll see in there is acidophil, just as eosinophil. But again, you'll see that when I get to that slide. And then this one over here is the basophil. Again, a way to remember it is they all end in what? So I just said they're the end and fill, so they're filled with with granules. These granules, you'll learn what each granule is in each of them. That's the first thing we're going to do after this review here. Right. These are not granulocytes; they are a granulocytes. That was up there. What a granulocyte is this? A monocyte, which will turn into a macrophage, which is something else we're going to talk about today. And then what's that other one over there? That big one. I shouldn't say big, but I'm saying bigger than the others. Because what's the biggest of all the leukocytes? This guy here. The monocyte is the largest. Because what is a monocyte doing if it becomes a macrophage eventually? Yeah, it's eating things. So we'll, we'll look at these pathogens and stuff that they're using. Okay, so any questions before we get into detail about each of these cells here? So the first one we're going to talk about, the neutrophils. Neutrophils, most or least numerous of the leukocytes? The most numerous. There's a number here, 50 to 70 percent. So again, you have that. I'm trying to organize it for you. And then, well, you see here they have these substances called bactericides. Hydrogen peroxide, superoxide. These are the granules. Because again, this is one of the granulocytes. So you should, uh, this, this is all important here. Okay, just make sure you have that, you know what's all there. They have bactericides, these are the granules that are in them, because as their name implies, what pathogen are they attacking? Yeah, bacteria, and again, pathogens are things that cause disease. So the, the pathogen here that we're attacking is a neutrophil. Again, neutrophil, you go all the way back, that's a neutrophil. It's a granulocyte, so I'm telling you the granules are the substances that are being released, those oxides, to kill bacteria. That's actually where that uh, brand comes from in terms of acne medication. It has that word neutro in it. And I think you guys know this, what is it? Yeah, Neutrogena, because they're talking about destroying and regenerating the body, destroying uh, the bacteria stuff. So, I'm gonna digest these pathogens. It's gonna form pus. So now, here's that word you always hear, pus. What is pus? Pus is basically these dead uh, bacteria that are being destroyed. In addition, it's these grains or these uh, granules, such as bactericides, and they're going to mix 
and they form this yellow, white, sometimes green color. There's other enzymes inside these uh, neutrophils as well too. And neutrophils attack bacteria. If you have a bacterial infection, you go to the doctor and what can you get? Antibiotics. Can you get antibiotics for a viral infection? No, but they're actually, they're starting to do that now. They, um, there's research out there that are finding that. So give it 10 years and you will. So basically right now, antibiotics will benefit bacteria. And that's what I'm trying to tell you is if you look at your mucus and it's clear, what type of infection do you think you have? A bacterial or a viral if it's clear? You have a viral. Because if it's bacterial, what type of cells are being activated here? The neutrophils. So when you see color in mucus, it means you have a bacterial infection. But it doesn't work 100% because when you get a viral infection, the first two or three days, uh, neutrophils are active as well too. But so you wait like about two or three days if your mucus turns back clear and it's viral. If it stays colored, then it's usually bacteria. Sometimes you can have both of them if you're that unfortunate. So uh, anyway, so that, that's what pus is. It's coming from a mixture of these dead bacterial cells plus pretty much the substances uh, that the neutrophils are releasing, these granules. They have color to them. Eosinophils, here you go. Another name is acidophils. Because what's the opposite of an acid? Base. That's why you saw basophils. So you have acidophils, you have basophils, and in between acid and base, we call that at seven, this is neutral, neutrophils. Because when you take blood and you smear it and you prepare like blood to look at under the microscope, and you go to stain blood, you put an acidic stain on the blood, then you put a basic stain on the blood, then you pretty much rinse it off. Depending on what stain it picked up, it's gonna be an acidophil that takes up acidic state, so that's why they're called eosinophils. Eosino meaning acidic as well too. If it picks up a basic state, it's a basal fill. If it's both pretty much equally, it's going to be a what fill? A neutral fill. So that's where they got the names for these. What these guys are attacking, again, is this a granulocyte or an agranulocyte? Right, so every time you see fill, it's filled with something, filled with granules, so it's a granulocyte. Their, their enzymes are going to be attacking parasites and worms. Parasites and worms are these, well, paras worm is a type of parasite. So the worms, are they the largest or the smallest of the pathogens? The largest. They take up, remember, the intestines, the blood vessels, they can swim through. So these guys are going to be attacking them. They also uh, can release stuff to, that cause allergies, that are called allergens or basically an antigen that causes an allergy, it's called an allergen. So they, they are sensitive to them. But something more specific about allergies that get activated are basophils. Basophils, again, another granulocyte, the last one of the granulocytes has granules, and it releases histamine. Histamines, I don't know if I wrote it in there, they cause what? vasodilation or like you get stung by a bee, like you say there's what around that area. Yeah, allergic reaction, inflammation, all the same thing. So they cause some sort of inflammation, allergic reaction. So that's why you would take antihistamines. What are examples of antihistamines over the counter? Benadryl, Claritin. Claritin is non-drowsy because it doesn't cross your blood brain barrier. So they're, they are antihistamines, so they're battling all this inflammation of dilating the blood vessels. You're dilating the blood vessels because you're trying to get more substances to that area to fight that infection, more blood cells to attack it. So again, the granule from here, the main thing is histamines. You also have heparin. Heparin prevents clotting. There's a word meaning prevents clotting or against clotting. Anticoagulant, that was one of the words on the first packet near the last or second to last slide. So it's an anticoagulant. So again, you want blood flow there because you want to get the cells there to attack whatever pathogen that's going to be. There. So yeah. out of our fills, out of the three fills, which one is attacking parasites and worms? The acidophils. Which one's attacking bacteria? Neutrophils. And what's the granule coming out of basophils? Histamine, right? And 
and heifer as well too. So those are the key things about your granule sites. So here's one of the A granule sites. It's a mono set. It's a mono site. Site meaning cell. Mono meaning what again? One. It's one big cell. It's the largest of your leukal sites. It's going to be a macrophage. So again, big for macrophage meaning it's doing what? It's eating up things. So macrophage is going to engulf large particles, large pathogens or pieces of them. Now we're going to talk more about those later on because they have different names. So just uh, keep that aside. And then the next thing here is the lymphocytes. So before we get into lymphocytes, I just want to see if you guys grasp. It's like a little short quiz here. Go to immune, log into immune. From there, there's a bunch of categories. This one's under anatomy review. And then from anatomy review, go here. And it's the number number four. Let's examine the cells of the immune system more closely. The cells of the immune system originate at the bone marrow. Some cells migrate to tissues to take up residence, whereas others circulate through the blood and lymphatic system, entering tissues when needed. Immune cells that travel in the blood are called leukocytes. Leukocytes have traditionally been classified according to their shape and the colors of their granules, if any, when stained with histological dyes. Click the beaker to stain the cells. Okay, so they show just one cup of stain, but there'd be an acidic stain you'd pour on them first. Then you'd pour after an acidic stain. What type of stain would you pour on? The opposite, basic stain. And then there's usually some alcohol, methanol you'd pour on them. But they're just showing it as one. It's called a right stain. The W. The five types of leukocytes, from most to least common, are neutrophils, lymphocytes, monocytes, which turn into macrophages when they enter tissues, eosinophils, and basophils. Let's see what you can remember about white blood cells. Click the cell that corresponds to each of the clues you were given. These cells have a bilobed nucleus and prominent red-staining cytoplasmic granules containing enzymes. They defend against parasites such as worms by releasing digestive enzymes onto them. They also play a role in allergic diseases such as asthma. What do you guys think? Okay. What's another name for uh, eosinophil because of the stain it's picking up? Acidophil. I think I heard it. Acidophil. So when things stain acidic, they have this pink red color to it. Something for microbiology, you want to start to get into your mind when you get to it. They'll say, instead of saying an eosinic, eosinophil dye, it's the same thing as saying an acidic dye. They'll keep saying it. So things that stay in acidic, they'll have this red, pinkish color to them. If they're basic, what color does it look that they're getting? Yeah, it's a more of a purple, like black color. So again, that's something if you want to help with microbiome, that's something to uh, pay attention to. These large cells have a U-shaped nucleus and no prominent granules. They develop into macrophages when they enter tissues. What do you guys think? Well, this is exactly how to ask you questions. Here's a question, here's a multiple choice, answer. These cells have blue staining granules and make up less than 1% of circulating leukocytes. Their granules contain chemicals that mediate inflammation, including the potent inflammatory mediator, histamine. I'll probably have a question like this with these exact questions and be matching. These cells have a multi-lobed nucleus and pale staining granules. <coughs> They are the most common leukocytes and use a process called phagocytosis to engulf and destroy pathogens. These cells have a rounded nucleus, no prominent granules, and are smaller than monocytes. 
Examples of these cells are B cells and T cells. You guys want to guess? <laughs> yeah, we need to cells. Well done. Okay. Going back here. So we'll start talking about the lymphocytes. But again, any questions before we move on to lymphocytes? Okay, so the second most numerous of the leukocytes, they tell you here 20 to 30 percent of all the white blood cells are lymphocytes. And yeah, it said their size is slightly larger than a red blood cell. Right, so lymphocytes, uh, part of the body's specific defense system. In a few moments, you're about to make a flow chart. We're going to work on it together to organize all the cells of the immune system. So I'm going to give you a little piece of this chart right here. There's another word for specific. You guys grasped it last time? Is it innate or adaptive? Innate. Yeah, it's adaptive. I don't know if I told you guys last time. Another word, again, it's, we'll get to it more officially in the next packet. But adaptive. Another word for specific immune systems, adaptive. Because if there are different specific things, you want that cell to adapt to that different pathogen you gotta attack. The innate then is another word for non-specific. Right, so again, you're gonna see this more formally later on, but I wanna try to use this one today. So it's part of the body's specific or adaptive uh, immune system. Now, the lymphocytes make three different lymphocytes. You've been seeing these letters every time you see the overview of the breakdown of the packet of what we're doing. There are uh, three, actually four letters. Uh, one of them, I'll tell you, are the T cells. What's the other one? B cells. Remember the other one? And K cells. Two of them are specific. Those are the B and the T. So if you want to jot that down, again, it will make more sense when we finally finish this unit of what I'm doing here. But the specific defense of adaptive, that it's only the B cells and the T cells. These are both lymphocytes. You, you will, again, put a chart. I know it's not making sense yet, I'll just do this. So B cells and T cells. The natural killer, they're not adaptive, they are what? And they, again, we'll, we'll get to explain that better later on. So before I just start giving you more things, I, I wanted to throw this in here and trying to like make you think about white blood cells and their importance, like why we would care whether we have a lot of them, why we care whether we have a little of them. So let's see if anybody wants to set, shed some light on like what it would mean if let's say we have a lot of white blood cells, or a little, whichever one you want to. Very good. If you have a lot of white blood cells, you're going to have an infection. So these white blood cells are fighting infections. They're part of your immune system. What about a low white blood cell count? You would be susceptible to infection, but something happens and becomes low. Something's attacking the white blood cells, and it's the biggest virus everybody here knows. Um, HIV would be lowering that cancer, they're growing out of control. So cancer is gonna be a lot. HIV, human immunodeficiency virus, kills your white blood cells. So that's why people die with pneumonia or something like that. So the HIV virus is a virus that attacks your white blood cells and causes you to have, let you read through this, which one of these Three red words. The first one, leukopenia. Okay, so both are results of infection. It depends what that infection is doing. The worst of them, well, I mean, they're both bad. They're both bad, but uh, viruses like HIV are going to kill your blood cells. If you want to know specifically, they're going to kill one of your lymphocytes. They're going to kill, even more specific, a T cell. Mm -hmm even more specific, they're gonna kill your T helper cells. These are things we're gonna actually get into today. So they're gonna kill your T helper cells, the HIV virus. So they lower your white blood cell count, specifically your uh, T lymphocytes. So they're so low, they're so low, so you're what once they're so low? You're in a condition of what? Leukopenia, but 
you're more what? Susceptible to an, inf to an infection. Good. You're more susceptible to an infection. So that's why whatever comes along, that we would fight off very easily the flu, um, anything, any infection, strep, will kill somebody because you have very few of them. This is the other word here. You guys know what the key is. Chemia is one word, if anyone knows the word. Cancer. Leukemia is cancer. Because cancer is caused by many things. It could be genetic. It could be environmental. You know, we can go into different things like smoking or, I don't know, like parents that had it or eating foods that don't have chemical that have chemicals in them. That's why people will eat organic things because there's some evidence that if you don't eat organic, you have more of a chance of developing uh, cancer because of the chemicals they put in the preservatives. So there's lots of different arguments of how it's going to be caused, but what happens in the end is whatever causes it increases the number of white blood cells. They grow out of control. They lose certain features. The body doesn't recognize them anymore. It can't do anything about it. And they just get into a very extreme high number. Which one of these three choices would you be like, let's say you had a flu, a little bit of a strong flu or mono? Which one of those three choices? Yeah, leukocytosis. Right? You're not, you're not, you don't have cancer but you have an infection, so you have a lot of white blood cells because you're fighting off that infection. Of course, there are breakage points for numbers. That's all lab values. I don't have to memorize them. But there's numbers. If you have over this, then you're that. If you have over this, then you're this. If you're under that number, then you have leukopenia. So there's break-offs for the amount of cells per unit volume. Now this, I gave you a one-page handout. You have the flow chart on one side. On the other side, it's a one-page handout. It's not in your packet. Uh, and uh, you have this picture on the other side. Not anything you really need on your test, but I just wanted to show it to you because uh, this is, you know, the area that I want to go into, so it's my interest. I just wanted to share it. So this is normal blood. What are the majority of all these cells that you guys see in here? They yeah, have red blood cells. What are these little dots here? Yes. What type of leukocyte is this guy here? <coughs> lymphocyte. Okay. So that, that's a lymphocyte, right? This type of stuff. Normally, how many lymphocytes you want to see in that area of blood? But over there, leukemia. Leukemia meaning a lot of white blood cells, but specifically a lot of, again, what type of white blood cells do we see here? <coughs> Same as that. A lot of lymphocytes. So there's a type of lymphoma. Right? You see a lot of lymphocytes in there. So that leukemia meaning it doesn't matter what kind of a white blood cell, there's a lot of it. This is an example of lymphoma, which is a type of leukemia. Again, lymphoma coming from lymphocyte, and there's a lot of it. It's not even regular shape. There's a bunch of things that are happening to it that are changing its shape. So that's what it would look like when you look at it in blood. Uh, I don't know if I told you guys last time. If not, there might be an opportunity when you're doing your blood typing next week, if I get the kit in time, that we can take your blood. I'll get the, the acid, the base stain, and just dip it in there, and you can look underneath and take a look at your blood. So hopefully everybody just looks like this. I'm pretty confident we'll all be fine. All right, wishful thinking. So I, the way I said to the last class kind of depressed them. I gave them the odds. I'm not giving you guys the odds. But uh, anyways... You can look at the odds on your smartphones if you want. But uh, anyways, so just moving on from here. All white blood cells, or all cells in general, all blood cells of the body, begin as one cell all the way at the top of your flow chart, the one I printed out for you very large. That one cell is a what? Okay, I'm trying to get you guys to say it so it's in your mind. Hemocytoplast. Where does that cell originate from? But it's in the bone marrow. So all blood cells, red, white, platelets, all of them start in the bone marrow. And then they're going to become different cells. If you look at that flow chart again, you have two ways that you can go down. You can go down to the right, you can go down to the left. If you go down to the right, what type of cell, what group is that going to be if you go down to the right? Lymphoid. If you go down to the left, myeloid stem cell. So those are the two blanks there that I'm trying to show you as every cell starts off as a hemocytoblast in the bone marrow. And then again, still in the bone marrow, 
it's going to go down one way or the other way. It's going to go either down the myeloid path or it's going to go down the lymphoid path. And then after that, we'll just count them. How many different cells do we have down here at the bottom? Yeah, erythrocytes, platelets, and five, seven. So we can become seven different types of cells. Now, one more slide before I have you guys do a little uh, practice here, a little worksheet. So. Lymphopoiesis, I should have put this a couple slides ago, but regardless, lymphopoiesis, is that a process or a hormone? Process. Because yeah, it runs. Process, poiesis. The hormone, what would the ending be? Not esis, but what? Yeah. E-N or poien, right? So, for example, lymphopoien would be a hormone making lymphocytes. Um, what's the hormone that's making red blood cells? Yeah, erythropoietin. What's the process of making red blood cells? Erythropoiesis. What's the abbreviation for erythropoietin up there? EPO. Good. So, starting off at hemocytoblast, going all the way down to the erythrocyte, that's erythropoiesis the hormone that's being stimulating these cells so they become the stages that they are is erythropoietin coming from the kidney. So the kidney secretes erythropoietin. It's the renal uh, cells of the juxtaglomerular apparatus if you're interested in knowing. But it just secretes it in order to make them. So this is what I want you guys to do. Is every cell starts off as that first stem cell, the hemocytoblast. That's that first one up there. That hemocytoblast, like we said, is going to become seven different things after that. All those seven cells at the bottom. But that one chart that you have is not going to finish off answering this chart for you. It's just taking you up to this point. The next thing is one of these seven is going to become three different types. Again, one of these seven is going to become three different types of cells. Of those three, one is going to become something else. And then of those one, you're going to become three different things. So the first thing is you should see a big page, full page of this. Don't use a small slide. The next thing is there are three slides that follow it. One, two, three. That have the answers to filling this in. Now, I know some of you are going to find it, so I'm just going to tell you anyways. The answer is a couple slides after that. But try your best, okay, so you understand this better, to read through this and take this information and to put it into this chart and see if it matches up with, with what's in there. Let's do a few minutes, work together. Gotta get a drink, get a bed. <coughs> All right, so uh, let's go through and do this here. <coughs> so everything starts off as a hemocytoblast. It's gonna go into seven things. I know you guys double check your answer, and that's fine, but I just wanna repeat this. <laughs> So which one of, uh, well, no, no, let's name the seven first. We got the fills, neutrophil, eosinophil, and basophil. <laughs> then we have the other egg renewal sites, monocyte and lymphocyte. Then we have red blood cells, and what's left over? Platelets. Which one of those seven is going to become three other things? Lymphocytes. Good, because we're going to start focusing now on lymphocytes. So this is your organization flowchart. I'll show you how it helps out. So lymphocytes, there's three types of lymphocytes. There are T lymphocytes, what's the next letter? B lymphocytes and natural killer. Of those three, which one is gonna turn into one thing here? B. B turns into plasma. Now something you can add here, and you're gonna notice you can keep adding things onto this diagram. The B, when it becomes a plasma, secretes those Y-shaped structures, so those are secreting antibodies. So a B cell gets activated, becomes a plasma cell, and will secrete antibodies. Again, we will review that detail as we get to it. I'm just trying to give you a little help right here. So which one is going to be in the middle here? The natural killer cells, the NK cells. That leaves the T cells over here. The T cells can become three types. They can become TH, and the H stands for helper. They can become TS, S is suppressor, and then TC, and C is cytotoxic. And they do exactly what their name implies. Helper is going to help, so we'll see how it helps. 
cytotoxic, has toxic things, so it's going to kill. Suppressor, what do you think suppressor is going to do? What does suppress mean to inhibit, decrease? It's going to stop the action of these other cells. Because you want to fight an infection. Again, always think about like a war. You want to battle things. You want to destroy them. Now you destroyed them, but you don't want to keep destroying all the villages and everything. You want to suppress at a point. You did, you fought the main infection, tell the cells to stop. So these are the suppressors which are going to slow everything down. Again, this is just a big uh, overview. And as we go through it here, through this stuff, I'll tell you, you know, you can add this into the diagram, you can add this into the diagram, etc. So here are the words to what you guys just did. The hemocytoblast, that's the first bone marrow stem cell. This word I want you to definitely understand pretty well at the bottom left. Differentiate. Again, it's another word you're going to hear a lot in microbiome. When a cell differentiates, it becomes more, you can add this word here, more specialized. Right. It changes into something and becomes more specialized. For example, a hemocytoblast differentiates into, let's pick one of them, a hemocytoblast differentiates into what went into this box here? Lymphocyte. A lymphocyte can differentiate into a T cell. And a T cell can differentiate into these. T helper even can differentiate into more T helpers. We're not going to do them in class. It could be T helper 1 or T helper 2. So things become more specialized. They differentiate, become different, but more specialized things. Right. Now, lymphocytes, you just did this on the chart, can differentiate into three different ones, natural killer, T, and B. I told you guys to just jot this note down. I didn't really explain it to you. But which one of these three uh, lymphocytes are, which one of the two are adaptive? T and B. Another word for adaptive? Specific. So this NK is what? Both of those words, innate and non-specific. Right, again, we will get into more detail on innate versus non-specific in the next packet. But for right now, just have this down there so when you go back, you'll see this multiple times as you go through. And again, NK stands for natural killer. <coughs> and you have your three types there. So we're going to start to look at these specifically. We're going to start looking at these three cell types right here. The cytotoxic, the helper, and the suppressor. With using clips as well too. Uh, one more thing here. The B cells differentiate into their plasma cells. The plasma cells produce antibodies. Another word for antibodies, again, which we'll discuss more in the next packet, are immuno globulins because they are blobs. If you remember, our plasma has three types of proteins. There are globulins, which is the case here. There are fibrinogen. And then there's the most type. What's the most type of proteins in plasma? Albumin. Albumin is mostly functioning as transport. Globulins, well, immunoglobulin. What's, what's the globulin that's in a red blood cell, that big protein in there? Hemoglobin. So, but in this case, hemoglobin is in the red blood cells, so it's not in the plasma. But that's a type of globulin. So, immunoglobulin is just another way of saying an antibody or a protein that's fighting uh, during the immune system. So, again, just pretty much a little overview before we get into detail right here. So, we're going to look at the lymphocytes. Lymphocytes, to show you an example of how this chart will help you that you just made. Lymphocytes are derived from what? main stem cell. Lymphocytes, are, it's a division, there's one or the other, lymphoid is one of the two ways. Where did the lymphocyte come from? What cell? Hemocytoblast. So again, I'm just trying to show you, you go back to your chart here, you add the lymphocyte, you go back up, and there's the hemocytoblast. But we're, start, we're gonna get into more detail down here. So I'm gonna ask you where did the T helper come from? It came from a T. Where did the T come from? It came from a lympho, etc. So this helps to bridge and put this connection of everything together. That's why I made this for you guys. That's why I'll help you uh, by being here today so you see that connection. So lymphocytes here, we're going to look at them, but specifically we're going to look at the T. Uh, the packet that I put here, and I, I thought I was going to go through all this, but I forgot to delete it. So this stuff is actually the next packet, plus the B and the natural killer on the next packet. So this packet, we're just focusing on the T. That's it. And the next packet will have these things there. So I should have um, deleted that. Okay, so if you want, you can put like, a little line right there. That's the end of this packet. So 
Again, just a, a little overview, and after this slide, I'm going to go to the IP videos. The T cells do cell mediated immunity. Again, you got to think of a war here. We have a pathogen, we want to attack it. There's several different ways we can attack it. In this case, we're looking at two ways to attack it. So one is the T cell, one is the B cell. The T cells attack in a way that's called cell me mediated immunity. Cell mediated immunity means direct, uh, direct contact, like face to face contact. These cells are going to come right in front of each other. So I guess direct contact. They're close. Again, you're going to see an analogy for that in a second. B cells are a type of humoral immunity. The way they fight is using antibodies. So the B cell can secrete the antibody. What cell secretes the antibody? The plasma cell is going to secrete the antibody. So B cells will turn into plasma cells and secrete antibodies. So another word for humoral, just, I want you guys to bridge this word together. Another word for humoral is antibodies. When we say that word humoral, it means antibodies. Natural killer cells work the same way as um, T cells, but not just T cells. You're going to see this a couple times in these clips coming up. The C. What's the C now? Cytotoxin. So natural killers work the same way, which is cell mediated immunity. So direct. So basically, cell mediated means you're close. Uh, humoral means you're far away. So let me show you what this means in, ter in terms of an analogy of this whole war stuff. So if you go to immune system, back to that main category, you have two choices to go to. Humoral. Humoral means what are we using to fight? Antibodies. So what cell is this going to be talking about? The B cell. Cellular immunity means we're close or far to the cell we're attacking. Close. So what cell is that? The T cell. So we'll look at this analogy first. You like that one? <laughs> As we've already seen, humoral immunity is mediated by B lymphocytes and the antibodies they secrete. In this topic, we will explore cellular immunity, which is mediated by T lymphocytes. In cellular immunity, certain T cells, called cytotoxic T cells, act like foot soldiers and engage in direct cell-to-cell -cell attacks that destroy the body's own cells when they have become infected or cancerous. Other T cells, called helper T cells, act to orchestrate the immune system's various responses. Okay. So it is showing you here this guy is right in front of what he's attacking. And we're going to learn what that sword is, what the attack device is. So just keep in mind direct, direct contact. So now we go look at the B cell analogy. Is that fun? Close defense mechanisms involving antibodies in B cells are called humoral immunity. When a naive B cell is activated upon encountering its antigen, it proliferates and differentiates into memory and effector cells. The effector cells are called plasma cells, and these plasma cells secrete large numbers of antibody molecules, each with the same unique antigen binding specificity as the parental B cell. The secreted antibodies act in a variety of ways to inactivate pathogens and toxins. So you see, he's, what, what is he shooting? What does this thing symbolize? Antibodies, again, but it's not the B cell that's going to do it. What's the B going to change into? A plasma cell. So again, you're getting the, the good idea. So when we get the details, you still have that big general idea in mind. So there's two ways to attack. We're going to be close. If we're close, what cell are we? T cell. If we're far away, we're going to be the B cell. So cell mediated immunity involves close or far away, but cell mediated close. And the other word for far away using antibodies is humoral immunity. And these natural killers act like uh, T cells, specifically cytotoxic T cells, which you're going to see. So they do cell mediated immunity, except these are more specific for your cancer cells cells that replicate out of control. The cytotoxic T are more cells that are affected by viruses. You'll see the explanation for that in a second. Okay, so again, where do all cells of the body, all blood cells of the body start? Start up in the bone marrow. So here we go, we have our hemocytoblast. 
what's the word for it's going to change into, be more specialized? Differentiate, right? Become something different. So it's going to differentiate into a lymphoid cell. The lymphoid cell, you know, this is where your flow chart helps because you follow down, right? Lymphoid one way. That lymphoid cell is going to leave, it's going to travel in the blood, it's going to go around, and that's going to finally land on one gland. And that gland is going to be right on top of the heart. What's the name of that gland? Is the thymus. Okay. The thymus is the gland on top of the heart. Okay, it's different than what you might be thinking here. What's this gland by the neck? The thyroid. They're different. Right? The thymus, you don't hear much about it because it's gone when you're 13. It atrophies. So you already will have the majority of um, your T cell differentiation. It doesn't mean you'll never have T cells again because those T cells will do mitosis and they will, you know, pretty much like cloning. There'll be more of that. So this is where they start off. So the lymphoid cell will travel through the blood and it's going to reside in the thymus. So when you're, you're growing up to 13, you're developing a big part of your immune system. And so once it gets into the thymus, it's going to differentiate and it's going to become a more mature T cell that's going to go around and it's going to start circulating throughout your body. That's why they're called T cells because they mature, or they, again, what's the word if they change? They differentiate inside of the thymus. The other cell is the B cell. Where is that one going to mature? Taking the letter B. Is it leaving? No. Where is it staying? Staying inside the bone marrow. So the lymphoid cell that stays inside of the bone marrow and differentiates, that's called a B cell. So that's where they get their letters for, B for bone marrow. Yes? Uh, yeah, they go through mitosis. So let's say you get an infection, right? They can replicate. They'll send uh, chemical signals out, and then they start dividing, and you'll have more of them. It's when they divide out of control that cancer will happen. But yeah, so because if we made our own and then they stop, then we're not going to have any more. Something that's finite is in women, uh, the production of eggs. Like you're born with the number of eggs they're going to have. That's why menopause happens because you don't make any more after that certain time period, around the 40s or so. So, but th these aren't finite. These, what will happen is you're, you start making them up to 13, and then at that point, if you need them, they'll just go through mitosis, the whole cell cycle, they activate. So yeah, B cells again coming from bone marrow because they stay, this box represents the bone marrow. They're going to reside and mature and differentiate in there. Natural killers as well too, but they're different due to their different antigens on their surface. So these are natural killers and I don't know, they could have given it a B or something else, but they decided to call them natural killers. Well, I'll tell you why they call it that. Right, well, natural killer because it's part of your adaptive or innate system. Innate. So it's not specific. So it's going to naturally kill everything the same way. That's why they call these the natural killers. Because they're not specific like these guys over here, which will attack one strain of the flu one way, one strain of the flu another way, or one bacteria will make antibodies against it, etc. So that's the difference where they're coming from. Okay, so we're going to show uh, a few more animations here. We're going to look at cell-mediated immunity, but first we're going to look at Cytotoxic T cells. How many different T cells am I giving you guys? Three. Cytotoxic helper suppressor. Again, that's where the flow chart will come in handy. So we're looking now down there at the bottom right on the cytotoxic T cell. So we're going to release toxins. Now, these words, you can write them in here, and you're going to see what they do. They're not in your packet, but I want you guys to know them. Actually, one of them's in your packet. So anyways, this is the sword. If you guys were watching that sword as he slashed the scarecrow, this is the attack mechanism. We're using two things. Uh, perforance, to perforate, like perforate your paper. What does it mean, perforate? <coughs> put, put holes. So these are going to put holes. And then these gray enzymes are enzymes, they're little granule enzymes that are going to go inside and kill a cell. So you're going to watch that process now. But that, that's the attack mechanism, that toxic part of the cytotoxic T cell. So it's going to affect attack cells that have viruses in them. So if you want to watch this one, you go to immune system. 
And then where are we going to go? Cell or humeral? We're talking about T cell. C yeah, cellular immunity. And that's video <coughs> number 11. It's a cytotoxic T cell. As we have already activated, CD8 cells become effector cells called cytotoxic T cells. Like the foot soldiers of the castle patrolling for enemies, cytotoxic T cells roam the body, searching for a body cell displaying the MHC antigen pair that they recognize. When they find this identifier, they kill the cell displaying it by triggering the process called apoptosis, which we have briefly discussed. Now let's look at this process in more detail. Drag the T cell to the virus infected cell. Okay. I'm not testing you on this, but you heard that word apoptosis, you'll hear it in microbiology. This process of how we're killing the cell is called apoptosis, because there's two ways to kill a cell. One is blowing it up, and one is kind of taking it apart piece by piece. This is the piece by piece called apoptosis. The other one has to do with the necrosis. So anyways, um, this one here, uh, we have a normal body cell. What do we call them, the name tags of a cell? Antigens. And not red blood cells have their own antigens. There's the A, there's the B, and RH. Right? But there's antigens all over the body. Antigens are just proteins and carbs sticking out of the surface that are telling you what cell it is. So when cells meet each other, they need a way to know what they're who's who. So when they come in here, these are self antigens. Do you want to attack self antigens? And then you get an autoimmune deficiency syndrome, AIDS. Right? So AIDS is not a disease, it's a condition where you're autoimmune, like you're deficient. Your immune system is deficient, you have a low number of cells. So you don't want to do that. So you go over here, okay, that's a normal cell. This cell here has a virus. So do we want to attack a virus infected cell? It's bad, so yeah, we want to attack it. Right? So we can't go inside and just take out the virus and then come back out, it doesn't work that way, you just gotta kill the whole cell. So what happens is, Okay, there are some self antigens here, but then here's a viral antigen. You'll see a little clip, but what happens is a <coughs> virus gets eaten up, the virus gets chopped into little pieces, and then they put the little pieces on the top of their cell, so when cells come by, they can attack them. Attack them. So, before I continue with this, let me show you <coughs> McGraw-Hill. If you want to watch this, you just write McGraw, and then T-cell. And the cytotoxic one. Yeah. When a virus infects a cell and synthesizes viral proteins, some of these proteins are degraded to peptide fragments. These peptide fragments are complex with class 1 MHCs and displayed on the surface of the infected cell. Cytotoxic T cells interact with the virus infected cells by recognizing both the viral antigen and the class 1 MHC. The cytotoxic T cell then releases cytotoxins which induce apoptosis in the infected cell and perforin which causes perforations in the cell membrane. Cell proteins are also degraded and the fragments presented on the surface via class 1 MHCs. This is not shown. Fragments of cell proteins are not recognized by cytotoxic T cells. Cytotoxic T cells remain intact, detach from the infected cell, and move on to other target cells. Okay, so what I'm trying to bridge here before I go back to the other video is here comes a virus, it injects its DNA, and DNA makes proteins, etc. So these proteins, excuse me, they're going to be chopped up. They're going to go on this thing called the MHC, which is in your packet, but I'm going to have you guys cross that off. But anyways, the MHC now is taking a piece of it and putting it on its surface. So when the T cell comes by, it's like, oh, okay, this is not, this is not a self antigen. This is a foreign antigen. It's not part of our body. So then it will start the reaction and then to kill the cell. So we'll see the killing process better in the other video. But that's what's happening, and that's how this piece got on the surface. Because it took pieces of the virus protein and put it up there. And an analogy is saying, okay, you have, uh, you have a couple people, let's say we have five people, and let's say there's eight people coming to us. So, okay, five of us can start to fight the eight, but then there's gonna be 10 more, and 10 more, and 10 more. You need what? You need 
We have need more reinforcement. You need more help. That's what's going to be the T helper. So keep that in your mind. But before the T helper, what you need to do is you need to kill some of these enemies. You display their parts. So when a cell comes by, they know what we need to attack. It's like you put your picture up wanted. That's what they need to attack. So it's going to come up here. It's going to bind. <coughs> Because this is an activated differentiating defector cell, no stimulation is required before the cytotoxic T cell delivers its lethal hit. There are two ways a cytotoxic T cell can signal the infected cell to self-destruct. The first way involves the release of pore forming molecules called perforins and hydrolytic enzymes called granzymes. Both perforins and granzymes are contained in granules released by cytotoxic T cells. When a T cell recognizes its target cell, it mobilizes its granules to the site of attachment and releases them into the narrow gap between the two cells. Click the cytotoxic T cell to release its granules. Okay, so this is how the perforins and the gran enzymes are going to work. Zoom in here. The perforin molecules that have been released elongate and insert themselves into the membrane of the target cell where they group together to form a pore. Click the space between the cells to create pores. Because right, there's two different colors, one of the perforins and one of the grain enzymes. What are the perforins going to do to the cell membrane here? Yeah, you want to use the same word? All right, put holes in it. It right, always told me never use the same word in definition. But yeah, I'm going to put holes in it. And they make these sounds inside the body too. The pores formed by the perforins are similar in size and shape to those of the membrane attack complex formed by complement. Like the membrane attack complex, they allow movement of molecules in and out of the cell. Among the molecules that enter the target cell through the pores are the granzymes released by the cytotoxic T cell. Pick a pore to allow granzymes to enter the target cell. Yes. Once inside the cell, the granzymes activate certain other enzymes, beginning the pre-programmed process of self-destruction that is apoptosis. Click the granzyme to trigger apoptosis. Yeah, this is the hard one. Yes. <laughs> so small. You got little Pac-Mans. This is why apoptosis is nice. It takes it piece by piece. The closest just boom, just fills up the cell. There we go. This first way of triggering apoptosis using perforins and granzymes is assisted in many cells by a second mechanism. This mechanism uses a special type of apoptosis inducing receptor on the surface of these cells to which the cytotoxic T cell can bind, triggering apoptosis. Cytotoxic T cells and the natural killer cells of innate immunity share these two killing mechanisms. These cells also share the job of immune surveillance, patrolling the body for abnormal cells. They differ in that cytotoxic T cells look for foreign antigens on MHC, while NK cells look for the absence of MHCs. NK cells are thus able to eliminate abnormal cells that cytotoxic T cells cannot detect. So basically it's saying what type of cells kill the same way as cytotoxic T cells? Natural killers. So they said the difference to tell you what the difference is. The virus infected ones, I mean it's in the writing so you guys can say this one. The virus infected ones, what which one of the two types? Cytotoxic or natural killers? The cytotoxic. Right, the cytotoxics are the ones that are going to attack the virus. Why? Well the virus comes in, we eat up the virus and we put a piece of it on the membrane of our own cell. So the cytotoxic find these things. What's the difference where the cancer cell is you don't have any, this is an MHC, this gray thing. Cancer cell takes these in and it's not recognized. It's, you're supposed to have some of them on the surface. So cancer cell doesn't have MHC, so it doesn't have antigen. It's like losing everything and it's just growing out of control. So the natural killers are looking for the lack of presence of these MHCs, so then they'll kill them in the same way. But they're looking in different ways, but they kill in the same way. So again, 
perforance and what's the other type of thing? Granzymes. Those are the sword that you saw for cell mediated immunity, the direct to direct contact. So any question with the cytotoxic? Again, something you just uh, want to take a note is that cytotoxics kill uh, used in this way and other cell kills using the same method here. Natural killers. So natural killers kill using the same way here, but the difference is natural killers don't kill virus infected cells, they kill what type of cells? The one we all hate, cancer cells. Okay. So natural <coughs> killers kill cancer cells. You don't have to worry about how they find them, but just they kill the cancer cells. Helper T cells, suppressor uh, cells, the helpers are going to come in and help. It's just kind of like your cytotoxics would be, I guess, your infantry, your front line. They just, they got a command, they just go kill. That's it. Find an enemy, kill an enemy. The T helpers would be like more a sergeant or a lieutenant. Okay, they have the ability to, to help, to give orders, to recruit more people. We need more B cells, we need more T cells. We need to suppress them, we need this. These are your main guys, the T helpers. That's the one that HIV attacks and that's why HIV is so potent. It's because you get rid of that main person in charge, that sergeant, general, lieutenant, whatever. So they, they are the big key guys and they're gonna stimulate the recruitment of all these other cells when needed or to stop them as well too by getting the suppressor cells to go and like, give orders to relax and stop. So they're that main cell that's in command of all the other cell types. So just to show you what's going on here, the next video says helper T cells. <clears throat> oh, come on. I only need two more videos today. It's not computer yet. Yeah, I think the internet's down. It's fine. We'll just continue. We'll probably start while I'm talking. So anyways, um, helper T cells, they're gonna go and they're going to just find who this enemy is, this pathogen, and they're gonna recruit more cells to help out. And there it goes. Maybe CD8 cells become effector cells. Despite what you might think, cytotoxic T cells are not the most important T cells. In fact, helper T cells, which outnumber cytotoxic T cells by two to one, are more important to the immune system, since without them, there is essentially no adaptive immune response. Helper T cells are almost always required for activation of both B cells and cytotoxic T cells. As we've seen in topic 5, helper T cells are critical for the activation of B cells and the humoral immune response to most antigens. To briefly recap, a B cell that has captured its specific antigen presents the antigen on class 2 MHC protein to an already activated helper T cell, which then provides the co-stimulatory signals necessary for full B cell activation. Click the B cell to activate it. Okay, we're not going to continue the B cell. That's going to be the next time. But so basically we bind here. That's the pathogen or a piece of it. And then we send these chemicals. I want you to guys to remember this word here. I taught to you last time. When you release chemicals and cells are attracted to it and they follow to that, that's the word of that process. I use the whole perfume cologne thing. Good. Taxis is part of it. Chemotaxis. All right, so due to chemotaxis, other cells will be recruited and will come to that area. So the T cell is secreting these chemicals, which will bring them to that region. Antigen, antigen again, I was talking about red blood cells. I said the antigen is a what for a cell, a name tag. So what I'm trying to get you to step above now is antigens are not just on red blood cells, every cell has antigens on it. They're the name tags of each cell. So there are good antigens, which are the ones we normally have in our cells, the normal ones. I don't know if you guys caught the word I used for the ones that are not part of our body. 
there are what are the other type of images? Like if you're not from this country, there's a word for it, right? So there are foreign antigens as well too. This MHC stuff, the next slide, even though I put it in green, I'm not going to ask you extra credit. You can cross that slide off. Where it says MHC proteins up top, the whole thing. The slide after that, you can cross that off as well too. Basically anything on MHC, you guys can cross off. Okay, there's three slides there in a row. Uh, what the MHC is though, just so you can, if you want a little idea on your minds, you've seen it a couple of times already. It's that blue thing that's going to hold the piece of the pathogen up there. So the, the virus comes in, we break the virus protein up, and we're going to hold it on the surface. That's the MHC. So they don't even ask you about it in microbio, I found out. But yeah, so you took it already? Okay, now, so yeah, they don't even get into that. So I decided to cross that stuff out. But anyways, uh, we're almost done here, I know. A little bit. Uh, wait, wait a second, is that time? Seven, yeah. Just give me uh, two minutes. The antigen presenting cells. They're going to do exactly what they say. They're going to present antigens. They're going to eat up, because what cell up here is the eating cell? Macrophage. Macrophage was a monocyte. So now if you go to your flow chart, you find that monocyte on your flow chart. You can draw a line down from monocyte and write a circle and write macrophage in there. Monocytes become macrophages. You'll see what I mean in a second. So their monocytes are eating, but they're not just eating. They're eating with a purpose. They eat and they break up and they take pieces and they present them on their surface. So when the T cells come by, they're like, oh, I see a piece of the enemy. I see a wanted ad. We need to go find the rest of these guys and kill them. So they eat and they <coughs> put their names up. So this is what happens. A monocyte will travel through the blood and wherever it ends up, it becomes a macrophage and it has a name. They still do the same thing. It's just like my name here uh, would be John in another country in Egypt would be Hunna. Like it's still, I'm still doing the same thing but it's a different name depending where in the body that you are. So here if you, um, if the monocyte travels to the liver and it resides in the liver, it's called a Kupfer cell. That's just the name of it, named after the doctor who discovered it, or talks about it. If a monocyte travels and goes through the blood and it ends up in the brain or the spinal cord, hopefully this word's a little familiar, it becomes a microglial cell. Now you memorize that on your test for cells that eat up debris, and that's what it's doing. If it travels through the blood and it ends up underneath the skin, it's called a Langerhans cell. If it ends up in a lymph node, which we'll talk about that in the next packet, it becomes a dendritic cell. If it travels through and it ends up on a bone, it's the name of the bone cell that eats up and crushes bone. It's an osteo-what? Clast. Osteoclast. So these are all derived from monocytes. If you remember what an osteoclast looked like, it has many, many nuclei. It's because many monocytes came together and transformed to this big one. And that's why there's lots of nuclei in there. So again, why, what am I trying to show you here? If you take your chart where it says monocyte, you can draw lines. Well, you could draw one line first saying macrophage. And then you could draw a couple lines out of macrophage and put these specific four macrophages on there, depending on where in the body they are. So again, off of monocyte, you could draw a line, and you could write mon uh, macrophage. For macrophage, you could put four lines and put these four cells that I just showed you guys. Any questions today? So again, this is what I'm showing you. When you're here, it's going to organize it. It's going to make your test easier. For those who are not here, Maybe they don't even watch. Then it's going to make it difficult. And then that's going to be all for today. It's going to be lab. If you guys have questions, there's still a few minutes before I go to lab, you can ask me. <coughs>